As we begin our study of sacred scripture, this, I think it would be appropriate to begin with a prayer. And for a prayer, I would like to use um, a short reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. For just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down, and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to him who sows and bread to him who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. This beautiful reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah shows the goodness of God, shows the goodness of God's word and God's creation. God's word is part of creation and all that God creates is good. So we engage in our study of scripture and in turn engage in the study of goodness, engage in a God who loves us deeply and has given this word for us, given this word so that it may be fruitful in our lives. Now as we begin the study of the book of Genesis, I think it's very important for us to have a larger notion of the study of, or a larger notion of sacred scripture. What exactly is it? How do we study it? Especially, how do we study it as Catholics? And therefore, like this reading that we just heard from the book of the prophet Isaiah, it will be more and more fruitful in our lives, in the lives of those around us, and in the life of the world. So let's try to get a basic understanding then of sacred scripture. So I think most of us probably know that scripture is broken up into two parts. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this word testament is kind of an unusual word. Generally, we think about testament in terms of the last will and testament. And but that's really not the meaning that it has when it comes to sacred scripture. Because testament is simply trying to translate a Greek word, which is translating a Hebrew word. The Greek word that we have is diatheke, which means covenant or agreement. And so we have the sense of the old covenant and the new covenant. The Hebrew word that the Greek word is translating is bereth. So any of us who may have heard of Jewish organizations like B'nai Bereth, we have the sons and daughters of the covenant. And so our sacred scripture then is a sense of God's covenant to us. God's covenant first revealed in the Old Testament and then later revealed in the New Testament. This is very important for us. For now, we'll set aside the study of the New Testament, always remembering that we have the fulfillment of many of our promises within the New Testament. But at the same time, we hear our first promises in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament continues to be a source of inspiration for all of us, and especially for the Jewish people, it remains their primary source of inspiration. And the Jewish people, of course, do not refer to the Old Testament as the Old Testament. Rather, they refer to it as the Tanakh. And that word, Tanakh, gives us a sense of something a little bit different than Old Testament um, gives us a sense of. So within the Tanakh, we hear three consonants, T, N, and K. And so those three consonants stand for the way we commonly divide the Old Testament, or as our Jewish brothers and sisters say, the Tanakh. So those three parts then are the Torah, which means the first five books of the Old Testament, sometimes referred to as the Pentateuch. And of course, we know those as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So 
Within the Jewish tradition, those are the most important books um, of their Tanakh. And as Christians and as Catholics, um, those also have a great importance for us. And one could kind of argue over what is the most important book, but certainly Genesis um, is a book that is at the foundation of our Christian life, really even at the foundation of our life as people, as members of Western civilization here in the United States. The book of Exodus is of enormous importance because it shows God's saving acts within history. And this idea of salvation then becomes an enormous part of what it means to be a Christian. So the Pentateuch then is very important. Um, and ultimately the Torah, which is another way of stating that. After the Pentateuch, um, or the Torah, we have the Nebi'im. And the Nebi'im is the Hebrew word for prophets. And prophets is a very large group. We have what we refer to as the former prophets, um, that are found in books like Samuel and Kings. And then we have the latter prophets, Sometimes we refer to them as the writing prophets. And the most famous, of course, would probably be Isaiah, quickly followed by Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And then we have the Book of the Twelve, and writings that aren't quite as long, but offer us very important visions of what it means and to be a human being, what it means either to be a Jew or a Christian in books like Hosea and Micah. So we have the prophets then is that kind of second part of the Tanakh, and we said that means Nebi'im. And then our final part is the Kethabim. And Kethabim simply means writings. And so within the Kethabim, we hear from a number of different um, groups, we'll hear a lot of wisdom literature. So books like Ecclesiastes, Job, um, are good examples of that. And of course, Proverbs. We have our Psalms. And then we have a number of other books like Esther and Ruth that are found within the Kethabim. So those are what makes up the Tanakh um, or the Jewish Old Testament. Um, as Christians, we've changed that order around. And so that becomes important for us to kind of get a sense of. And we've really focused as Christians on the prophets. And so this is where I said earlier that perhaps um, we could see something other than Genesis as Exodus as the most important book. Um, and we could look at something like Isaiah from which Jesus um, referred so frequently. And we see that Jesus' ministry is often understood somewhat and in certain gospels even greater as a ministry of a prophet. And so we therefore have the prophets and ending up with Malachi leading us into the New Testament. So we have those different orders and it's good for us to be kind of aware of that um, as we look at what it means to study scripture. So we therefore then can think about the importance of the Old Testament and how as Catholics we want to study the Old Testament. Um, oftentimes in our history as Catholics, things have gotten kind of a little bit confused and due to various other religious movements and um, due to political movements at times, we have taken some emphasis off of scripture and that has been exaggerated in certain places. But really we want to always have scripture as a central part of our prayer life, as a central part of our church and to realize this great gift that we've received from the Jewish people, the people whom God first gave his word to. And out of this, we can see at a number of times that various leaders, various popes um, have emphasized the Jewish people and emphasized scripture. So just recently, Pope Benedict XVI reminded us of a famous dictum, a famous saying that was given or that was said by Pope Pius XI. Pope Pius XI in the late 1930s 
when he was confronting the rise of Nazism, the reality of the ugliness and hatred of anti-Semitism, made a point in 1938 to a group of Belgian pilgrimages coming to Rome, saying, spiritually, we are all Semites. So this really then undergirds the reason why we study the Old Testament. Spiritually, we are all Semites. And also, this was the only book that Jesus studied. And so I feel like if this was good enough for Jesus, this should also be good enough for us. We, of course, also have the great gift of the New Testament, but we should never ignore the Old Testament. We should see that there is great importance within it and understanding it. And so we must then think about how we are going to read the book of Genesis. And as we try to understand reading the book of Genesis, we must kind of confront a number of problems that are out there. And we have to think, what's the first thing? What's the most important thing when we read the book of Genesis? And the most important thing is that we read this book literally. And by literally, I mean that we try to understand those stories that we make those stories our own stories, that we can recall those stories. So a literal reading of the book of Genesis is a reading in which we understand it, we can recall it, and we can carry it with us. And so that's always our first challenge. And that challenge can be a different challenge for different people. So. I think the most common challenge that we all have is that challenge that I mentioned of simply understanding the stories, of understanding the different books, and making those books a greater and greater part, and those stories a greater and greater part of our life. Our second challenge is something that may be reserved to a smaller group of people, and that is making sure that we're reading the right text, and so that we in our history have really focused on trying to understand the biblical languages and making sure that we have the best text out there. And that's something that, as I said, is a challenge reserved to a smaller group of people, but it's still a challenge to make sure that we have, let's say, the best Hebrew text, or if the best Hebrew text isn't available, that we have the best Greek text. And so this is all part of literally understanding the word and making sure that we have the right word. When that goal has been accomplished, our next goal then is to understand the spiritual sense of the word. And that spiritual sense of the word is very important because we have at times some confusing stories, at times even some disturbing stories. And so we must always try to move beyond simply being able to give a plot summary and to see how is God working in this story? How is God speaking to me in this story? And when we focus on that, then we bring the Bible to life and it becomes a greater and greater part of our life. And so that's our second challenge that we have in, in coming to a greater understanding of scripture. So we focus on reading the scripture, knowing the stories, and then after we know all those stories, gaining a spiritual understanding of those stories and making sure that those stories remain alive in our life and understanding that scripture is the word of God and that the authority of Holy Scripture is the authority of the Holy Spirit. And so this is something that renews us each day offers us um, great possibilities. So that then is, our, is what we're trying to bring to and understand within scripture. Now I'd like to spend a little bit of time focusing especially on Catholic biblical interpretation and seeing some of the challenges that we've had over the centuries, but also seeing the great place where Catholic biblical interpretation understanding is right now. This, there has never been a better time to study scripture as far as I'm concerned. We have many great resources out there and many great people. 
And so, therefore, let's quickly look at some of the challenges and the church's response to those challenges. So the first challenge came very early in the church, in the second century. We had a heretic named Martian. And Martian only wanted to study certain parts of the New Testament. He wanted to disregard completely the Old Testament and, um, and then disregard a number of the Gospels he didn't like. Well, we don't get to pick and choose the Word of God. We have canons set up by um, church leaders that share with us the entire Word of God. And at times that may be challenging, at times that may be, not be something we want to hear, but it's always something that we have to hear. So we were able to move beyond Martian. Another great challenge was simply illiteracy. For many centuries, very few people could read um, the Old or New Testament. And they were often reserved in abbeys or, and in monasteries. Um, so we didn't have much access to them. But once we came around to the 15th century, to the various renewal movements that were going on at that time, that ultimately led to you know, the, the Protestant Reformation and led to the Catholic Reformations, Reformations that had been going on in many respects. Certainly as Franciscans, we think of Francis and Dominic as leading movements focused on the Word of God. And then in 1417, you know, at, the, at various councils, we see a similar um, movement. And then we see um, movement at the Council of Trent later on in the 16th century all focusing us on the Word of God, but also realizing some of the challenges and difficulties of that time. More and more we saw people becoming, focusing on rationalism and focusing on trying to explain everything in Scripture. We would even see someone like Thomas Jefferson in our own country taking out all the miracles of Scripture as he tried to make it something that was a scientific document. And the church responded to that by focusing on the importance of revelation and once again saying that we can't just take what we want from the Word of God, but we must focus on all of it and see how God challenges us and gives us a great gift within that. And finally, the church started really responding to all these challenges. First, I would say by Pope Leo the Thirteenth, um, around um, 1893, issuing a challenge to learn the biblical languages. Um, there was also difficulties at that time as he was very nervous about some Protestant views of scripture. But that challenge to learn sacred scripture was something that would provide, that would be helpful. I would say in 1943, Pope Pius XII really moved us forward and got us close to an equal footing as we also recognized some forms of higher criticism, like form criticism and source criticism as something useful and helpful. And then from there we moved to Vatican II. In, in 1965, Dei Verbum, there was a complete recognition of all the good work that had been done on scripture by our Protestant brothers and sisters and in urging to work with them and in order to understand scripture better and better. This is continued on um, and we've seen in various documents such as the 1993 document by the Pontifical Biblical Commission um, a greater understanding of scripture, all the new gifts in terms of how we study scripture through a sociological lens, through the social sciences, and um, through a greater understanding of literature. And finally, just last year, there was an ap apostolic exhortation issued by the Pope, Verbum Domini, where these methods were once again highlighted with perhaps a greater emphasis on trying to um, use the spiritual sense and making sure that the spiritual sense never gets lost. In this apostolic exhortation was also an emphasis on Lexio Divina, the prayerful reading of little pieces of scripture, um, which to me seems something that's very healthy and very helpful for us. So we see that Catholic biblical interpretation has grown throughout the years and given us something very solid as we um, move forward and try to understand scripture. Now, there would be two very important parts of 
and this formal higher criticism that are very important for the book of Genesis. The first would be something that was developed by the German scholar Julius Wellhausen um, in the 19th century. He looked at the book of Genesis and he saw that there was a number of areas where there may have been overlaps, um, where there was kind of different messages being given, and seeing things that didn't seem completely consistent. And therefore he came up with a theory called the documentary hypothesis. And this is really vital for helping us understand the book of Genesis. So we'll see in the book of Genesis that there's two stories of creation. We'll see at times that the same episode happens with Abraham and Sarah. And we'll see this idea of sibling rivalries happening again and again. And so we'll see that there's different perspectives on that. And Wellhausen broke those four perspectives into um, four letters, which we say J, E, P, and D. Wellhausen, being a German, um, would refer to um, the Lord as Yahweh, but with a J in there. And so therefore we have this Yahwistic perspective, and that's the J source. And this would be an older source, perhaps a source that represents the monarchy that would have moved from David and Solomon down to Hezekiah and Josiah. So that's one source that we find. We find another old source called the E source, Elohim, which is another word for God. So we sometimes refer to God as Yahweh, and in the Hebrew, we sometimes refer to God as Elohim, which simply means God. This is an old source often attributed to dreams and um, is a fairly small source, but different once again. The third source would be the P source, the priestly source. We believe this is probably the last source and the editor of the Old Testament. And we can see that editing hand at work frequently throughout the book of Genesis. And our final source is the D source, and we refer to this as the Deuteronomist. This won't have an influence in the book of Genesis, as it's first seen in the book of Deuteronomy. So this helps us then understand the various pericopes, which is another kind of technical term for stories of a certain length, and gives us kind of a, a way to grasp those. And we'll focus very much on J and P within the book of Genesis. And our other great um, scholarly contribution is by Hermann Gunkel. And Gunkel focused on form criticism. So form criticism was when we really focus on very small stories, maybe stories between, at times, even four verses up to and maybe 20 or 30 verses. And Gunkel saw within this kind of different things going on, different emphases. Some stories could be used to explain the name of a place. Other stories could be, explained, could be used to explain why we have certain customs. And Gunkel always would try to look at the form to see whether something was perhaps more prophetic, something was more legalistic, something was poetic. So this second type of higher criticism coming from Germany has also had a great impact on how we study um, the book of Genesis. So once we have these two elements, um, we gain an understanding of just how important scripture is for us and how important the study of scripture is. And so therefore, at times this can be a challenge to people who simply want to focus on that first method of literalism. And this is a challenge that the church is aware of and that the church has, has responded to in these documents that I referred to earlier. And it's really the challenge of fundamentalism. So within fundamentalism, we see in this pontifical biblical um, commission document from 1993 a description of it, saying fundamentalism demands an unshakable adherence to rigid doctrinal points of view and imposes as the only source of teaching for Christian life and salvation, a reading of the Bible which rejects all questioning and any kind of critical research. So we've just been referring to these two forms of critical research, and we can see that fundamentalism is going to reject that. But ultimately, this Pontifical Biblical Commission document 
tells us that fundamentalism is a form of intellectual suicide. It's not something that's going to help us grasp the power of the Word of God and the meaning of the Word of God. And we always must be focused on that. Now let us quickly kind of do a summary of Genesis and see what we have within there. In this course, I'm going to focus on five areas. I'm going to focus on the creation stories, the whole primeval history, that is Genesis 1 through 11, in which the creation stories are included. I'm going to focus on Abraham. I'm going to focus on Jacob, and finally on Joseph. Of course, there were many people involved with them, and we can't cover everything that happens in all 50 chapters of the book of Genesis. Abraham, of course, had, had um, children with three women and seems to have been married twice. Jacob had two wives and two other women that he had children with. And these women play very important roles, and we will highlight those at times. But the scholarly study often talks about the Abraham cycle, the Jacob cycle, and the story of Joseph. So while I will spend a lot more time talking about those, I'd like to focus on some things now that I won't really be able to have time to focus on. So the first thing that I won't really be able to focus on too much is some of these minor figures but still important figures within the book of Genesis. For example, in Genesis chapter 38, we have Tamar, and a very unusual and a very challenging story in which a woman ultimately works as a prostitute to be able to keep alive the name of God and to keep alive God's line, and a very important story. Within this story, we find this challenge that God often works through in the most mysterious ways. And God can take someone who's working as a prostitute and posing as a prostitute, and yet she is more in the right than the patriarch Jacob. And so we'll see a story like that and realize that God is often on the side of the underdogs. God can hear someone that we least expect, like King Abimelech, a, a Gentile king um, from the south, and um, someone not part of Israel, and God hears that prayer. God can hear Hagar, um, a slave woman from Egypt who um, had a child with Abraham, and when she would appear no longer to be useful, God comes into her life and restores her and makes her son the father of a great nation. So we have this theme of underdogs that's very important within this material. We have another type, of, another what we refer to as genre or form of literature, genealogies, um, that we see quite a bit in the book of Genesis, and then we'll see them at times in the book of Chronicles and other parts of the Bible. These genealogies offer us, rather than a narrative, they offer us an enumerative um, view of God's people. And so we'll see within the genealogies um, how we can move from Adam to Noah. And that will be kind of summed up for us in a very vertical genealogy. Other times we have horizontal genealogies where we'll look at the sons of Noah and see how one of them ultimately um, continues this line that leads to Abraham. But the other two form different peoples and give us a sense of the nations. So that second point that we have then is genealogy, which is very important for us. The third thing that we have is the importance of God's speech. And God can speak to people that we don't expect and that aren't necessarily the greatest heroes. So we've made that point already by seeing how God spoke to Hagar. God speaks to Rebekah and God speaks to Abimelech. The fourth point that I'd like to focus on is that there are many different formulas throughout the book of Genesis that at times aren't very obvious when we're reading it in English or can be overlooked. But there are lots of structures, and we can think of structures such as a chiastic structure, which builds up to a point in the middle of a story and then 
kind of walks back down from it. There are formulas where we talk about the toledoth, the generations, and that breaks things up for us too. And we can see from a priestly perspective that we'll have a line of people such as Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses, and a structure to that. And the last thing that I'd like to focus on is the significance of optimism within the study of sacred scripture. Yes, we will hear some difficult stories, we will hear some confusing things, but ultimately this is a very optimistic story. We see God time and again responding to sin, responding to our hardships, finding a way where there doesn't appear to be a way. This optimism seems to be, in many respects, the governing principle of the final editor, the final priestly editors of the Old Testament. And I think that same optimism is something that must be at the heart of our study of sacred scripture. We must always be asking ourselves, how is this good news? How can we share God's love and God's grace with those around us?